I'm Charles Annie Golden. Now let's consider all that you've heard on this program today with our two analysts who are with me for the rest of the program. The journalist, political commentator and Arise News analyst, Dr. Constance Ikoku, and the current affairs analyst and professor of communications at Bayes University in Abuja, Professor Abiodun Adeni. Thank you very much indeed to both of you. And let me start with you, Prof. Um, Let's start with the first topic we had on the yeah. program um, today, which is the divisive issue of restructuring, um, with its protagonist, Ambassador Humphrey Ajak, or making the case for restructuring now and drawing a very grim picture if we don't. How powerful is the argument from both sides? Well, it's. Um it's a long drawn uh, debate. You know, we have had such debates in the past. We have had one around sovereign national conference. We have had one uh, around fiscal federalism. We have also had another one around resource control. Even confederation has also been one of those um, uh, cliches brought over uh, for us to brought forward for us to discuss. You know, consistent with our nation conversations around how well we want to build our nation. Uh, so it's not um, it's not really new. We have had also had it, you know, APC promised it at the time, and when they came into power, we had them set, we saw them setting up committees. Eventually, we didn't hear much of it. But to, to, to a very large extent, I saw his argument, I could reason with him, but it just tells me that it, 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 what we have now is not very, very effective. But rather than maybe looking at a different kind of structure, you know, have, have we really been concerned about making what we have now much more productive. You know, he was concerned about people looking for always towards the center, you know, and this is obvious because um, other levels of government are not strong enough. They're not strengthened enough. You know, they're not productive enough. Local government, for instance, um, is almost moribund, you know. States, for instance, there are questions around them. If you look at some of the laws that are supposed to be pan-Nigeria, most of the time, the effectivity of those laws can only be measured at the national level. Mm. You know, so um, the, the other argument point we have to look at is, is it okay for us to just look at strengthening what we have now in the place of any kind of restructuring? The second, uh, the second uh, uh, issue I see around it again is that questions around restructuring also ignore the human element, you know, the question of leadership, human resources. You know, um, how effective, you know, have we... I've been able to, um, uh, what's our experience with respect to human resource uh, management? Then what about institutional strengthening? How really strong are our institutions? I dare say that our institutions are not strong enough. You know, um, We have a situation where the individuals often time is often stronger than the institution, whether, whether actual or virtual. And that's what we see happening around us. So it doesn't matter really, in my own opinion, what kind of structure you have. Right. If some pieces in the, in the jigsaw are not right, there's no kind of structure that you bring to the fore that you not still see some of this thing mm. uh, replicating itself. That's a very reasonable argument, isn't it? But I think the point that the protagonists of this um, incarnation of restructuring are making is that this is an opportunity, given the political situation in Nigeria at the moment, where clearly there are lots of restive elements across the place, that this would be an opportunity for the president to write his name in gold and use it to really leave a legacy for this country and try and settle things as they are at the moment. What are your thoughts? I mean, it could be an opportunity, and it is a fundamental question. <clears throat> It is a question of can you do without devolving powers? Because people have used so many different names, uh, decentralization, yeah. through federalism. But at the heart of it yeah. is devolution, as, as, really. As, exactly, yeah. exactly. So can you do without it? It seems like we cannot. Uh, the reason being that um, he talked about micro-states or nation-states. Let's use an example of Europe. Is it possible to lump Italians, Spanish, French and maybe the Polish together in one country in a centralized system that suffocates them and expect them to try. Well, the answer is it isn't. Ex exactly. They <laughs> Which is why they've got the EU, a loose confederation. Ex exactly. I mean, exactly. a loose grouping, but because certainly what, not. Um, what we call ethnic groups and yeah. nation states yeah. 
individual nation states that can thrive on their own. So mm. if you want this kind of big United States kind of country in Nigeria, it is possible. But you would have to tweak the system to make that work. So you would have to have an equitable system that is based on respect for mm. one another, on equality, on the fact that, yes, we want to be together, but this is how you have to talk about it. Yes, there have been so many different talks in the past. Uh, Prof mentioned uh, Sunbury National Conference, but we come back to a new government. Every new government decides that they're not going to touch it because it is a very hot topic. It is complex. It is highly contentious. The question then is, do you as a country want to move forward? Do you want to thrive? Do you want to do well? Or do you want to keep going through political cycles and elections that are totally meaningless mm. and take you nowhere? So it is an existential problem that needs to be solved. And I agree with um, Ambassador Ojiako that if you do not solve that problem, you cannot go far as a country. Mm. So Prof, Prof, why is it so contentious. I mean, because l listening to Dr. Constance Ikoku talk and listening to you earlier, I mean, it, it seems like a fairly logical and reasonable thing for a country such as Nigeria to aspire to do. I mean, what is at stake here which makes so many Nigerians reluctant to countenance the possibility of politically restructuring this country? Well, you, you will have to understand that Nigeria is a very fragile um, state. You know, we are very pluralized, and sometimes there are deep-seated suspicion here and there, an ongoing crisis of confidence. Sometimes we try to paper over it um, around electionary elections. You know, and sometimes we are often unfortunate to have leaders that remind us of our difference. So when we are reminded of our difference, you know. Um, it, it just trigger off those base, our base instincts, you mm. know. The classifiers that actually uh, make us different are, uh, are rigged up, and of course we begin to fear what will happen next, you know. So when you talk about restructuring, people become concerned. Mm. Will they, um, how would they fare if any leader wants to embark on it? And that's why you find uh, people um, somewhat reluctant, like you said. And sometimes I also wonder, you know, how easy will it be if we have to actually think around it, um, considering the fluidity of our politics, considering the fact that you know, some leaders will actually privilege political consideration over uh, the actual process of embarking mm. on any restructuring, given the misinterpretation that's likely going to come um, in the process. You know. um, the few times we have had some levels of restructuring have actually um, been carried out through military fiat. Mm. Yes, we, military is gone now. We do not expect them uh, anymore. You know, the only mechanism that is available for us to activate it now will be probably the National Assembly. Well, we have had the National Assembly in the last 24 years. We've been trying to do some constitutional review, and you know how fundamental that can be. I'm not sure we have succeeded in that regard, you know, to a very large extent. So if restructuring is going to happen, we also know it's going to be through the prism of the legislature. Mm. So if in, the, in an area we haven't succeeded, then what is the guarantee that something much more fundamental, uh, uh, like restructuring, that we're going to succeed um, in that regard? So what I think essential is that, and when we keep talking about some of these um, when we're making some of these calls, we are simply saying that, you know, our leaders are not managing our divides very well enough. You know, they're not margin managing our differences well enough. You know, so that's why the clamor for citizen participation and inclusion, citizen in in interest in the governance system uh, could be heightened, you know, to remind the leaders of their responsibility, you know, take up make uh, deliberate policies, direct policy directions that will integrate every section, give them that sense of belonging. That sense of belonging, not just in mouthing it, but of course right. in realistic terms. And you see these agitations will keep uh, pitching out. Okay. The most important thing is resource control, you know. How do we share um, resources right. are we fear in the are we fear enough in the way we are locating or sharing resources there are suspicions that were not being fear i do not forget there are also other underlining argument argument around population explosion right. you know argument ag around you know the fact that some people are permanently excluded leading to insurgency right. separatist movement etc etc our leaders dealing with these questions rightly 
I, I dare say they are not really dealing with it. And of course, you continue to see some of these calls. Right. But okay. when all these questions are probably answered with the right leadership, I think the questions will move on right. well. And of course, some of these questions will reduce, and the agitations will also okay. reduce. So well, that's that's, that's, no, that's okay. But that you're making some very okay. sound points. So let's okay. move away from restructuring and talk about what's happening in uh, Israel and the Gaza Strip. Um, the Israeli government, I mean, we had Arik Muchnik, who's a uh, former paratrooper, so he's kind of looking at it from the inside, but he's also a security expert, counter-terrorism, he's Israeli, he's got family there. Um, I'm sure you've heard the Israeli government has ordered a complete blockade of Gaza. No food, no water, no electricity, no fuel. Um, also, more than 500 Palestinians have been killed so far in the violence since Saturday's attack. And, of course, more than 700 Israelis have been killed. What's your assessment of the situation? There? I mean, this has been a devastating blow on Israel. And I think that they were caught on the West. Uh, reports indicate that there were intelligence failure and it happened and they were left scampering and trying to put together a response. I mean, they have been responding uh, forcefully, uh, mm. which some say um, it's lethal and they might have to pull back a little bit. But this is really, really um, a serious one for them. But we also know that this part of the Middle East has been defined by carnage ever since Israel was created in 1948 on Pal Palestinian land, uh, fully backed by the United States, mm. the United Kingdom, and other countries. Um, so there has been a tit for tat between you know, the countries. Israel has more power, it's, uh, it has uh, more military uh, equipment, it's, it's, it's more funded, it gets a lot of financial assistance from the United States and other uh, states in uh, other countries in, 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 in the West. And then, of course, you know that the West fully supports Israel because they feel obliged in some way to support a state of Israel in mm. the Middle East because of what happened, happened with the Jews being expelled from Europe. So it's a very complicated situation. And um, uh, in Palestine, on the other hand, they are on the weak side. They have all the support of the Arab states uh, within that region, but that doesn't count for much. Mm. You know, they are squaring up uh, against a bigger power indirectly. You know, in in support of um, of of Israel. So, I do not think that this is going to go down well, and this particular problem will continue for a very long time right. because you're talking about uh, land. Uh, Israel continues to encroach okay. on Palestinian land. So it, it's a problem that won't go away for yeah. a very long okay. time. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there because we're out of time. Uh, you gobbled up a lot of time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, well, so, let's have a two-state solution. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a good way to end. Um, that, that's a good way to end. I, I want to thank you very much indeed. Uh, Professor Abiodun Adeni is a current affairs analyst and professor of communications at Bayes University in Abuja. And of course, Constance, Dr. Constance Ikoku, is a journalist, political commentator, and a rise news analyst. Thank you very much indeed. You're welcome.